Does anybody here not love the pier? I'm going out for the Good. Then we're all on the same page. We're going to have a good time tonight. Uh, Jim Harris, uh, Executive Director of the Santa Monica Pier Corporation and author of this uh, America, Santa Monica Pier, America's Last Great Pleasure Pier. The first edition was called Santa Monica Pier, A Century on the Last Great Pleasure Pier. It came out in 2009. That should give you an idea of when the pier opened. Did I trip on something? No, you're good. It's on the time, right? It's on the time. Ah. Okay. <laughs> um, I also wrote a children's book, some of you may be familiar with, called Stella Rose and the Sea Dragon, co-authored by my uh, then 10 year old daughter about her overcoming her fear at the age of eight of riding the sea dragon on the pier. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I've written many plays. I have a degree in theater. I wrote a play that we perform on the pier almost every year called Save the Pier, inspired by the community's, the, the true story of the community rallying to save the pier from being torn down. So you might say that I am pretty well attached to the pier, especially with words. That attachment began in almost 35 years ago, September of 1989, when I took a job as a bartender at what was then the Boathouse Restaurant. Memories? Anyone remember the Boathouse Restaurant? So at that time, the Santa Monica Pier had about 2 million visitors a year. And the bulk of that was summer tourists. Using the pier as a bridge to get to the beach, there was no west end of the pier. It was being rebuilt. Storms had torn it down. We'll get to that later. There was no amusement park. You know, there was a, we had Sinbad's, an empty Sinbad's building. Many of you may remember Sinbad's. And uh, so we had many tourists that would just use that bridge to get down to the beach. And I can tell you, for two months of the year, we were pretty busy in the boathouse with people stopping. The other 10 months of the year were pretty dead, so we needed to save our money <laughs> and appreciate the, the fact that we even had a job. Um, there were three other demographics that were uh, composing that two million people on the pier. There were homeless. Uh, those of you who were around in 1989 remember that there was a pretty, a pretty dramatic, desperate homeless situation. Palisades Park was actually chained up, uh, chain link fence. Uh, the pier had a, a tent city of homeless people there underneath it. We had um, a lot of gang activity. One of my first Saturday nights working at the, the boathouse, I made the 911 call on a shooting right outside of the boathouse. Discovered a year later, I had to go to court and remember it all. Um, but, but we had that. But there was a fourth demographic. And it's a demographic that I, at that time, called old timers. We all called them old timers, those of us that work there. And it's uh, people that were about my age now, <laughs> <laughs> who would uh, come into the boathouse. They came to the pier every day of their lives. It was just what they did. And they would come into the boathouse and over coffee or cocktails talk about what the pier used to be like. And I learned early on that the best way to make a buck as a bartender is to sit and listen to somebody's story. So I got to hear all these wonderful stories about what the pier used to be. And do you remember Moby's Dog? Of course not. I just began working here <laughs> in 1989. Do you remember Sinbad's and all these things? Um, do you remember the 24-hour the cafe out at the end of the pier? No, I didn't remember these things, but please tell me more. And I, I came to fell in love with the pier that I had never known and imagining it on the pier that I was on. And it's been a really special 35 years for me here now. Um, as I mentioned, I've written a couple of books. We give historic tours on the pier that I, a program that I've put together. And I found a way to incorporate the, the pier as I know it and the pier's history into some certain events. Uh, some of you may have been to the Pier 360 Beach Festival where we put up a pop-up museum. That's all, that all has roots in those old timers who are coming in and telling these wonderful stories. Now, of course, I did the real research in writing um, the, the original history book in this and spent a lot of time in the, the library reading every single one of those evening outlooks because in the Santa Monica Public Library, that's not indexed. <laughs> so every, every copy of the paper, every headline, every article is just related to the pier. And it was a wonderful way to really learn the history of Santa Monica. And of course, I just focused on, on Santa Monica Pier. So don't ask me about the, the law about having a lone cow in your yard in 1908. <laughs> That's all I know, is that that was there. You know. um, but really good stuff, and uh, a wonderful, wonderful way to learn the history of Santa Monica. Um, on to the pier's actual story. So the pier, um, the pier opened on September 9th, 1909, which if you write numerically is 
9909. It works well with school kids, so I'll probably get back to it later. <laughs> 9909. So if you're, if you're starting to think ahead, we're going to have an anniversary here. We're going to have our 115th anniversary coming up on September 9th this year. And it opened on September 9th, 1909, and it looked like this. Nothing like the pier that we have today, right? It was actually built by the city of Santa Monica for a very specific purpose. And does anybody have any idea what that purpose might be? Judy, I know you know. Oh. <laughs> Sewer! Yeah. Judy has heard me speak many times, and she actually knows the history of the pier very, very well. It was built to uh, solve the city of Santa Monica's uh, problem with accumulating sewage. Uh, and there is a sewer pipe running underneath this pier, 1,600 feet out into the ocean, where once a week the city would dump treated sewage into the ocean. But there's a lot of people here on September 9th, 1909, celebrating something, and it's not a sewer pier. If you look very closely at the pier, there are no deck boards. This is the first pier on the west coast of the United States, and the second in the world made entirely of concrete. So that's why the citizens of Santa Monica are here celebrating. And there was a big celebration. There was a parade from City Hall. There were races and games on the beach and in the water, swim races. George Freak, the, the man who introduced surfing to the mainland United States, was a judge at these races. There was a, uh, a tableau vivant. Are you familiar with the, the, the theatrical term tableau vivant? It's a play, but it's like a stop motion play where people would um, get together for a scene and they'd be frozen in motion and then they'd tell a story that way. And this was the story of Rex, Rex Neptune, the, queen, the Lady of San Monica. So the story goes that Rex Neptune jumps up on this pier and he's gonna destroy it like all those other wooden piers that he's been destroying the storms for, for his entire life. And Lady Santa Monica steps out from the crowd and says, oh no, not this pier. This pier is made of concrete, you can't destroy it. Rex Neptune looks down and realizes that he's been defeated by technology and is cast away into the ocean in a sea of flames. How they made that stop, stop motion, I have no idea. But I do know that there was a fireworks show immediately following the play. It's a play that I would love to find a script to and, and uh, recreate someday, uh, being a, a playwright, a theater major and a playwright. Um, Lot, lots and lots of excitement. Um, something that, uh, that's not in the first book, but came as a result of the first book. I have uh, had donated to me two of these medallions that were distributed on September 9th, 1909. They are, uh, they are in my office right now, and Rob, I'll give you one. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, this would be a good home for one of those. Absolutely. Uh, Rob and I have been talking about them be donating a lot of our archives over the years, and I need to free up storage space, so this one's taking up about this much space. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry, you're. laughs> uh, those, the concrete pier, uh, you, may, you may have noticed that the pier's wooden today. So that concrete pier, the pilings on that original concrete pier last about 10 years. Built to last forever, new technology, uh, they, the um, engineers didn't really realize that uh, beach sand would not be the best material to use in their concrete, being that it's very porous. The salt water seeped in, in through the, the pilings and uh, rotted out the ironwork underneath, and, and the pier actually did collapse. While the mayor was at the west end of the pier, observing a naval flotilla passing by, it collapsed about two feet while the mayor and his party were standing out at the end of the pier. So you close the pier, uh, you know, big panic, what do we do? They actually replaced those concrete piles with wooden piles, creosote treated wooden piles, through the concrete deck. And so we had a concrete deck over wooden piles. This actually made an issue of popular mechanics, the, the, the fascination of having a wooden, wooden piles supporting a concrete pier. And uh, you can read that article actually inside the merry-go-round building. We have it framed in to read all about that. It's really a wonderful story. So the technology wasn't quite there for the concrete, but it was a nice effort, and it gave us a wonderful opening day on what day? Nice. 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 I told you I was going to ask you again, and you're all right. You'd be as good as any school kids. 
Now, the citizens of Santa Monica, of course, after September 9th, 1909, were not satisfied with uh, their pier being a sewer pier. We went a mile south of them was the Ocean Park Pier and Lick Pier, which later became POP. Probably, many of you probably remember POP, so you know that location. That had an amusement park on it. Another <coughs> few miles south of that was the Venice Pier, another amusement park pier. And here in Santa Monica, we had a sewer pier. North Santa Monica, we had a sewer pier. So there were people that wanted what our neighbors to the south had. They wanted an amusement park here. And there were people who wanted a yacht harbor right from the beginning. The, the concept of building a yacht harbor and having that adjacent to the municipal pier. And ultimately, both groups got what they wanted. The first group being the people who wanted an amusement park here. And into the picture entered Charles I.D. Luth. Has anybody heard of Charles I.D. Charles Luth? Of course you have. Nick. Nick's on my board. He knows all of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Charles Loop, a very famous carousel carver, carved the first two carousels of Coney Island, and then uh, uh, fashioned himself as a, an amusement park entrepreneur and built amusement parks all across the United States. In 1916, he uh, entered the picture and leased the land just south of the municipal pier to build his own wooden pier adjacent to what was still down at a concrete pier and, uh, and open the Louvre Pleasure Pier. And the Louvre Pleasure Pier would have a, it had a uh, wooden roller coaster. It had a, uh, a fun house called What Is It? It has this uh, giant aeroscope ride, which is, these are, there are boats at the end of this. You can kind of see one there. And as it would go faster, those boats would swing higher. And I think, you know, as terrifying as some of the roller coasters are today, this would have easily scared, scared me far more than any of those rides. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the, his uh, crown jewel, the Louvre Hippodrome. And inside that would be a Louvre carousel. Right? So, 1916, the carousel opened. They, they threw open the doors and, and turned on the band organ, and you could hear the band organ in downtown Santa Monica probably still could today if we played that band organ often enough and threw open the windows. We played recorded music that you can actually have a, a conversation over. Um, this building, uh, very unique, very wonderfully and ornately decorated, the onion dome on the top, uh, this, uh, these little extra domes, the things that aren't there anymore that we all wish we could have back, but it's a beautiful, it's an extraordinary building. So much so that, uh, and, and, and there were buildings like this all up and down Santa Monica and Venice. Mixed, this mixture of architecture and a very fun, um, fun feel to the buildings. This is really one of the last ones standing. And in 1987, it was uh, entered into the National Registry of Historic Places. It's a national landmark, that building. Santa Monica Pier is not a national landmark, an official la national landmark, but that building is uh, since 1987. It's the highest distinction a building can have. It's a very special place. Upstairs, uh, apartments from the very beginning. Uh, offices now, and my office is up there. But uh, inside those apartments, two children were born. I had the good fortune of meeting one when we uh, celebrated the 100th anniversary of the building. She was, I think she was 98. But she made it up those stairs to see where she was born. It was really cool. And uh, you know, there have been some very interesting and notable characters. You can learn about each one of them inside the book. Uh, you know, for a long time, word had it that Joan Baez lived up there. She didn't, but one of her best friends did. <laughs> One of her best friends did, and, uh, and I, I reached out to, many, many years ago, I reached out to Joan Baez's manager and asked if it was true that Joan lived in the carousel. She said, no, but her best friend, Colleen Creedon, did. And she connected me with Colleen Creedon, and Colleen Creedon, to this day, is one of the most fascinating and interesting people I've ever met in my life. She was a, an activist. Uh, she held parties in the merry-go-round to support the causes of Daniel Ellsberg, and um, Cesar Chavez, when the pier needed, needed to be saved, the community fought to save the pier, parties inside the merry-go-round fell by Colleen Green. Um, her nickname was Merry-Go-Round Granny. <laughs> <laughs> and she was the, a character that everybody sees very fondly of. Uh, when I asked, well, I did get to meet Joan, several of us got to meet Joan. She played at one of our Twilight series, and actually she was hanging around for years before. We finally got her backstage, and everybody was very excited. 
Um, the way she put it is that uh, she may not have lived there, but she crashed there enough that it just felt like home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're all about many other people that lived up there in the book. Yes, I'm pitching it. Buy the book. By the way, um, you're, if you're purchasing the book today, you're supporting the museum. Um, I, those are not my copies of the book. Happy to sign them. Mm -hmm. Support the museum. Thank you. Uh, Charles passed away in 1918, so he didn't actually see the, his, uh, the, a big success for his peer in the two years that he was there. It was still, still new and still developing. Passed away in, a, in 1918, and his son Arthur took over, and, but Arthur was splitting time between Santa Monica and Santa Cruz, where he was building another amusement park with one of his father's carousels and a big wooden roller coaster. Have you been to Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk? That wooden roller coaster is Arthur Luth, Charles' son. And that carousel that's still there today is a Charles Luth <coughs> uh, carousel. Uh, I'm, I'm going to digress a minute. Inside our Hippodrome today is no longer a Charles Luth carousel. That only remained in place until 1939, when the company that took over the property from Luth, the Luth family went bankrupt and a bank took over the property and sold the only thing of, on the pier that of value, Charles Luth Carousel. Sold it to Belmont Park in San Diego, where it remained until 1976. In the 1970s, there wasn't as much appreciation for carousels as there was in, in the early days and even today. And that machine was uh, sold out horse by horse to, to bidders. So those horses are all over and they've been separated since 1976. Inside the carousel today, we do have a genuine antique carousel. It's a 1922 Philadelphia Tobago Company, number 62 off of their line. All those horses are the original wooden horses since 1922, 100, almost 102 years old now. And uh, we're very proud of this carousel. So in 1924, in, uh, in Arthur finally was finished with, uh, with his father's amusement pier and sold it to a group of realtors who extended the pier to another several hundred feet to accommodate the what was built as the largest ballroom in the world, the La Monica Ballroom. And this is the ballroom. You see that wonderful ornate um, architecture. Again, very, very unique. Uh, opened in the summer of 1924. And uh, on its opening day, it drew over 50,000 people just to see it on its opening day. 10,000 of those people made it inside the doors, and 5,000 actually got to enjoy the dance floor. 50,000 people is a lot of people. Yeah. So you remember our Twilight concerts, mm -hmm. where you know, all sorts of numbers were being thrown around for how many people we had gathering on the pier and beach. But really, the, the, the cap of what we have is about 25,000 people. So if you can imagine two times a Twilight concert, that's the numbers being reported for this. The, one of the, the great things that I've read about it is that that opening day was the cause of the very first traffic jam on record in Santa Monica. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, a lot of people. Was it 50,000? Maybe. You know, maybe there's an exaggeration, but it was certainly a big event in Santa Monica. Uh, the ballroom uh, opened up and it had, uh, it, you know, it was, it was wonderfully ornate inside. Unfortunately, it opened at a very very unfortunate time. Um, that winter, its first winter, a uh, storm battered the, under, the substructure of the pier so badly that they had to close the, the La Monica Ballroom, replace the substructure, replace the floor, and then they, they got it up and running again. And a couple of years later, of course, came the financial fallout from the beginning of the Great Depression. So while you may have heard of the La Monica Ballroom, you probably haven't heard of much of that's gone on there because it was not a, it didn't get to enjoy its full life, the true ballroom. During the Great Depression, uh, Santa Monica opened it, or Santa Monica leased it from the realtors to open it as a convention center. <coughs> there were dances still held inside. There were dance, dance a thons, you know, the, the drop, the dance till you drop. If you've seen the movie, they shoot horses, don't they? That's inspired by what went on inside the, the ballroom. Uh, the city shut that down for health reasons because people dancing to the, till they drop, not the most healthy activity. Yeah. Uh, it was used temporarily as the jail 
when Santa Monica City Hall moved from Santa Monica Boulevard to the location that it is now, they needed temporary holding cells, so there were temporary holding cells put inside the La Monica Ballroom. There were actually two jail breaks, it was not a very good jail space. Uh, it served as a roller rink twice in its existence, once in the 1950s and again in the early 1960s. And then uh, by 1962, the building was not being very well cared for. You know, it was, uh, there just wasn't, you know, they were trying to find uses, and, uh, and rather than uh, keep up the building, they just let it go, they let it, basically let it go to, go to waste. The walls were buckling, the roof was caving in, and the building was condemned and torn down and became parking lots. To give you an idea of how big this building was, you all know Pacific Park today, the amusement park on the pier. That is the same footprint that the La Monica Ballroom was on. Mm. Now the ballroom, one thing I did skip, the ballroom did enjoy some success, and somebody mentioned his name to me earlier before I started talking. Um, in, 19, in the 1940s, a musician named Spade Cooley played inside the ballroom, and he did a, a variety show called the Hoffman Hayride. And KTLA, uh, a new television station, came into the ballroom and broadcast that show live. And it was the first ever live broadcast of a television variety show inside the La Monica Ballroom on the Santa Monica Pier. Um, newscaster, I'm forgetting his name, he was on KTLA forever. <laughs> anyway, they had, um, he, he told me the story of, uh, they, they always shot commercials, live commercials um, during the show. And they had a car inside from one of their commercials, and the the reporter um, stamped his foot on the bumper of the car, and the bumper fell off the car. <laughs> Live TV, just a lot of fun and a lot of great. So Stan Chambers told me that story. Stan was a, another wonderful person to me. So um, Santa Monica Pier had its uh, had its amusement pier, had its, had a dance hall that was a, an extraordinary newsmaker. And uh, the people who wanted an amusement park got what they wanted. And that amusement park remained in place until the Great Depression, 1930. And then, by then, um, you know, the, the amusement parks were failing because people couldn't afford to go to amusement parks and enjoy themselves. So the amusement park was torn down, except for the merry-go-round building, which has been in place ever since 1916 and remains today. The other group actually benefited from the Great Depression people who wanted a yacht harbor. Because Santa Monica needed to create public works projects and get people jobs and find other, way, other uh, sources of income. So building a yacht harbor made a lot of sense. Build a breakwater pass, to pacify the water, sell mooring space, create opportunities for more businesses on the pier, uh, and put on the city council put on the ballot the, the creation of Santa Monica Yacht Harbor building and, and the specifically stating that this would provide jobs for Santa Monicans. Santa Monicans would build the breakwater and create business opportunities for Santa Monicans. So <clears throat> the proposal called for building a concrete breakwater and extending the pier out as a, as a bridge to this concrete breakwater 300 feet off the end of the pier, and people would actually be able to walk on it and fish off the end off of this breakwater. So the, the citizens overwhelmingly approved this initiative and work began on the first, of the first two cribs, which are sections of the breakwater in San Pedro. The first crib was brought and, and dropped off of 300 feet off of the end of the pier, and a week later, a crack was discovered in it. Now remember, concrete, we'd already had bad luck with concrete once. <laughs> and uh, so here we were facing, a, some Hawkins were facing a disaster you know, this, we put this money into uh, a yacht harbor created, uh, made with a breakwater that's not going to hold. So they invited, the city officials invited the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in to assess the problem, and they said, well, you can still build a breakwater with the money you've got, but it should be a, a rock mound breakwater. And so sure enough, the city started bringing in rocks from Catalina and dropping them here, and you can see these women in this publicity photo. Um, playing on, on the rock mound breakwater. You don't see people playing on, on it today because there is no bridge out there. This is strictly a simplicity photo. <laughs> and, uh, and sure enough, the creation of Santa Monica Yacht Harbor, which should answer the question of 
why does the pier sign not say Santa Monica Pier? It says Santa Monica Yacht Harbor. Mm -hmm. This sign was installed in 1941, summer of 1941, um, after a, after the project that uh, it was a, a highways project that gave us what we call the Matahiko today, and the McClure Tunnel, and and all of the interchange to bring traffic up into into Santa Monica and vice versa, and the brick pier bridge that goes over it. If you look at, at this photo, you really can't see much of the pier. You can see the top of the merry-go-round here. So the businesses, the business owners on the Santa Monica Pier were very concerned about this. People not being able to see what was over that, that bridge and be able to see the pier. So they pulled their money together and they created this sign. And it, you know, to them it was a to them it was a big deal. I think to us today it's an even bigger deal. Yes. You know? <laughs> because it is it is uh, what uh, people people don't even read that it doesn't say Santa Monica Pier, but they know where this sign is. It's a Santa Monica mm -hmm. But at that time, it was Santa Monica Yacht Harbor, sport fishing and boating and cafes. And it was a very active and, and wonderful Yacht Harbor. I love this photo. Did not make the first book. I had never seen this photo until about six months before um, I submitted photos for this book. And I was so happy to come across it. Because it still has the ornately decorated Monica Ballroom. You know, all that, all that's still there. It has the Chesapeake Cafe. This is Sinbad's. It was called the Chesapeake Cafe mm -hmm. back then. Right, um, the old fisherman's grotto. But you see, you know, the you have the yacht harbor and the ballroom. It, it just has so much in it that's so so wonderful. Everything that's wonderful about the pier. And then way back here in the distance, you see the USS Saratoga. This is a 1935 photo. And uh, for Navy Day, the Saratoga and a couple of other ships would come to Santa Monica, and the sailors would come ashore, and citizens, Santa Monica's, the general public were allowed to go visit the ship. And so it was a wonderful thing, a wonderful promotional thing that they did on Navy Day. And uh, this continued for a couple of decades. Um, in fact, do you, you're all familiar with Playland Arcade, I take it. And the Gordon family, Marlene, the oldest sister, said her favorite day of the year was the day that the sailors came. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a you know, wonderful, wonderful slice of history. Also, you see the Dogo Club right here, one of the private beach clubs. Um, now we call that the Doville Lot because it burned down. Um, and then, so so having the Yacht Harbor, the Yacht Harbor was a, a semi big success. Opened in 1934, um, but along and, and with it came a lot of characters. You know, the, the fishing boat captains because their fishing boats would operate off of this. Fishing boats all have always operated at the pier, but now they have pacified water and they can really expand their operations. And one of the most interesting fishing boat captains was a man named Olaf Olson, who I got to know through reading the Evening Outlook, and he's mentioned a lot, and all in his retirement. You know, Olaf Olson was a, a Norwegian immigrant, came here as a child with his family. His real last name is Krog. However, the customs clerk reportedly could not spell Krog. It's K-R-O-G. It's not that hard to spell. But um, he said, oh, all you Norwegians are named Olsen anyway, so just wrote, wrote their name down as Olsen. So he became Olaf Olsen. Um, he loved the ocean. When he was old enough, he joined the Navy as a sailor, or a career sailor. Uh, he got out of the, the Navy, retired from the Navy, moved to Santa Monica, and fell in love with all the, the boating activity happening around the Santa Monica Pier, and opened his own fishing operations off at the end of the pier, and eventually took over those operations. He was the main operator of fishing operations at the end of the Santa Monica Pier. He was a, a big-hearted guy. Um, first off, he loved telling stories, and even though he had a very thick accent, um, children loved to listen to his stories just to hear him laugh. They didn't know a word he was saying, but once he started laughing, they laughed along with him. It was like a fun game that they had. Josh Velasky told me that story. You remember? You know, Josh. Josh um, owns the uh, the bait shop at the end of the pier, uh, and he's been coming going to the pier his entire life. Um, uh, the big heart of guy, Olaf Olson, he, uh, during the Great Depression, he would donate a percentage of his cash to needy families. And he would always take one person from the Unemployed Gentlemen's League out for free on one of his boats. Every day he would offer that opportunity. Ooh. He was also a pretty physical guy. He, uh, in the Evening Outlook's cent um, centennial edition, that hardbound book, celebrating 100 years of Santa Monica. There's a story of Olaf Olsen 
that says that there was a gas station robbery happening at the gas station in the middle of town. And up drives Olaf Olson, and with a pile driver fist, ended the robbery. <laughs> so just a wonderful guy to learn about. And then I get to his obituary, and it's heartbroken. I think it was 1950 or 1951. And the very last line of the obituary says, he was also the physical model for the character Popeye. <laughs> Now, you know, we've, we've run with this story for the last 15 years, and I make it very clear in the story. Elsie Seagar, a um, very famous cartoonist, wrote for Hearst newspapers, and he wrote a, a, a comic strip called The Thimble Theater, and featuring the oil family. Castor oil, olive oil, ham gravy, those were the characters, and it was all about that family. And one day, um, well, Seagar lived here in Santa Monica, had an office at 4th and Broadway, I believe. And every day they would walk down to the end of the pier and rent a rowboat from presumably Olaf Olson, but from one of the operators out at the end of the pier. And they would go out in the bay and discuss story ideas. Well, one time, one of these ventures, they came up with the idea that the oil family needed to go on a, a boat ride to Dice Island, which is a gambling island, patterned after Catalina. And uh, they needed to create a very specific, unique looking fishing boat captain. And so they used, Pop, they used the Olaf Olson as that physical model. Now, we don't go so far as to say that, that Popeye the character was patterned after um, Olaf Olson because Seagar was very specific in his characters being patterned, being um, inspired by people from his hometown in Illinois. And there's a man named Rocky Fiedler who the character of Popeye is, is patterned after, is um, inspired by. But it is impossible to deny the fact that this gentleman had an influence on what Popeye looked like. Mm -hmm. So we run with that, the physical model for Popeye. In the 1930s, uh, water activities were getting very popular. It was free to go swimming. So a lot of people in the water and uh, creating the need for the lifeguard force. And in, the 1930s, in the early 1930s, Santa Monica created their own Santa Monica lifeguard service. And their original headquarters was actually where Rusty's uh, surf ranch is today for about a year. And then they opened up a headquarters out at the very end of the Santa Monica Pier. That's what you see here, is uh, their headquarters. And, uh, and in this photo, some very distinct personalities. Cap Watkins, the founder of the Santa Monica Lifeguards. Very good friends with uh, uh, Governor Earl Warren. He became uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren, that Earl Warren. This gentleman here, a man named Pete Peterson. Ooh. Was that you, Nick? Oh. <laughs> Somebody here has heard of Pete Peterson. Yes? You all should have heard of Pete Peterson. Um, Pete Peterson was uh, recognized by surfers and, and lifeguards throughout the world as being one of the greatest watermen who ever lived, if not the greatest watermen who ever lived. Uh, I could go on and on with many stories. I can include some stories in the book. One of my favorite Pete Peterson stories. Uh, he could do anything in the water or on a boat. One of my favorites is he was um, out at sea, alone, in, in his boat, and the boat began taking on water. It had a, a hole in the back, and it began taking on water. Um, realizing that the boat was going to sink before he could get back to the San Monica Pier, he came up with a very clever idea. He punched a hole in the front of the boat, and then turned the engine on full blast, so the water just ran from, through one hole and out the other, and he made it all the way to the San Monica Pier. That is super clever waterman thing. Yeah. <laughs> but the reason you would have heard of Pete Peterson is uh, he was also he was a craftsman and an inventor. And he made, we have a, a, a dory that we show off at, at the pop up museum every year that we do for Pier 360. Inside the merry go round is a skiff, a rowboat that he made. He made paddle boards. But the thing that you all have seen in your lifetime and probably didn't realize the name is the Peterson Rescue Team which is that orange foam tube that you see at every swimming pool. You've seen it at every swimming pool, every lakeside, every beach. The one that you wrap around your waist and you clip, invented by Pete Peters in Santa Monica lifeguards. So you've heard of him. You just didn't know that you've heard of him. He's a hero at the pier. Um, another hero that we celebrate at the pier is uh, this young lady right here. Dottie Hawkins, and I know Lucy posted a lot about Dottie Hawkins. Her Dottie, birthday is coming up. Her birthday is coming up. Uh, another one who I had the, the wonderful pleasure of getting to know um, later in her years, but uh, 
we spent a lot of time together. Um, so paddle boarding became very popular, really through the Santa Monica lifeguards. Tom Blake was the inventor of the hollow paddle board, um, and he invented it in Hawaii. He, he was from the Midwest, went to Hawaii, learned how to surf, and learned surf culture from the Hawaiians on solid wood boards. Solid wood, well, usually coal wood boards, and very, very heavy, like 100 pound boards. And uh, in his mind, it was ridiculous that a board had to weigh that much. So, being a craftsman, he invented the hollow paddle board, which lowered the weight to about 70 pounds. Still a heavy board, but significantly more uh, easier to work with and more accessible to people. He brought his design to the mainland United States, worked with the Thomas Rogers Company of Venice to mass produce his boards. While he was waiting for that project to fully come to fruition, he joined the Santa Monica Lifeguards um, for a, a short while. And when his boards were ready, he introduced Santa Monica Lifeguards to his boards made by the Rogers Company. That board uh, became a standard life-saving tool for not just Santa Monica lifeguards, but other lifeguard forces throughout Southern California. We have one hanging in the merry-go-round building, by the way. If you haven't been there lately, I have this little display of all these antique boards and, and the Peterson skip. Go check it out and look at the one that's hanging up from the ceiling, because that is that is a, a genuine antique. It, it's, it's a priceless board. Probably, I would say the most valuable thing on the pier, but it's not. Um, so who is Dottie Hawkins? Dottie Hawkins, um, at the age of nine, would uh, her father would pick her up from school in Hollywood and uh, on the back of a motorcycle with her pet duck in a little cage on the back of the motorcycle and they would drive down to, uh, to Santa Monica and he would work out at Muscle Beach and after his workout, they would rent paddle boards from underneath the pier, the little shop that was underneath where, uh, where Bubba Gump Shrimp is now. And, uh, and they would go play in the water. And she saw that, was, that she was pretty proficient um, on the paddle board, even though it was a 70, 70 pound paddle board. She was a nine year old girl, she, was really, she really had a talent there. So he entered her in a race, a paddle board race held at Bionic Creek against adults. You know, her contemporaries were not out there. She took third place against adults. And her father, you know, light bulb goes off in his head and says, you know, I've got a child prodigy, I've got to do something with this kid. Well, he, he didn't have great financial means, and the people who were putting together these races were the private beach clubs up and down um, north and south of the pier. So, um, he vented his frustrations to Cap Watkins, who I pointed out earlier, and Cap said, I think I can, I can help you out. We have some storage space on the lower fishing deck of the pier here, and why don't you just, you know, find a way to get some boards, and you open your own paddle board club, and, you know, if, if you know, you know, challenge the private clubs, so be it. But at least you have some place that you can always call your home for and create a paddleboard club. And so he did. He created a paddleboard club called Huey Myoki Oki, which is a tongue twister. Uh, later renamed the Manoa Paddleboard Club. And uh, the, the star performer was always his daughter, Dottie. Dottie entered many, many races after that. Uh, you can see her name in a lot of evening, evening outlooks. She never took less than first place. This paddleboard club became a great spectacle for the pier. Now this was um, you know, the, the late 1930s, 1939, 1940, up until the, the mid-1940s. And, um, and you could watch these people playing in the water on their paddleboards, and it was fascinating. They invented paddleboard water polo, and they invented paddleboard water ballet, which is like synchronized swimming on paddleboards. If you can imagine, visiting the pier and seeing this going on down below you. Um, it became so popular that celebrities began, celebrities began to attach themselves to the club. Burgess Meredith was a regular member, a regular visitor to the club. Johnny Weismuller, who we've, we identified earlier in this photo. One of his board is up here, but here's Johnny. Johnny Weismuller, Tarzan, Olympic gold medalist. Um, and here he is again on a paddle board. Dottie and Johnny got to be very close. Dottie was about 16 in that photo that I just showed you. Um, but she'd known him for, ever since she was about 12. Um, and every time that Johnny needed to get into shape for a Tarzan movie, he would call on Dottie to, to go work out and they would go paddle together. And they had a great friendship. And, uh, and so the, the Manoa Paddleboard Club you know, centered around Dottie. That, the ballet show traveled the world 
Buster Crab had a, a traveling water show and enlisted the paddle board club to travel around the world. At age 17, Dottie got in an argument with her father and left the club and left the pier and never looked back. In fact, she hadn't been back to the pier until we invited her to be a part of our Pier 360 Beach Festival in 2015, and she did attend. She passed away a year later, but it was a really wonderful experience. And, and a few of her contemporaries that were in the club showed up as well. It was a very special experience. The, in, in 1946, the paddleboard club, the, the ballet club, had special boards made and painted with stars and stripes um, motif to celebrate you know, the soldiers coming home. And uh, we have a replica of Dottie's stars and stripes board in the merry-go-round with <laughs> some of the boards that I, put, I hope you go see someday. So the pier throughout the, uh, after the Second World War and then throughout the, the heyday was really the mid to late 1940s. And then by the 1950s, everything was coming a bit passe and the pier was getting pretty run down. Come 1960s, uh, the city of Santa Monica is trying to figure out what to do with their rundown pier. The state of California is also looking at the pier and dreaming up uh, the state of California thought that, that it would be a good idea to have the pier be a part of a causeway and replace the, the Pacific Coast Highway with a highway that would now run on the pier and then through a series of islands to Malibu. Uh, that I didn't get very far, but there are some really interesting drawings in, in, in the book. There's a drawing of, that, of what that would look like. Um, people, you may have seen on Facebook, somebody keeps posting the same photo and the same drawing on Facebook, and the islands actually spell out O-I-L, oil. <laughs> and that is the photo that I used in the book. Um, but by the late 1960s, the uh, city of Santa Monica was really getting frustrated because the pier was costing a lot of money. Now at this time, the, the city still owned just the municipal pier and was taking care of just the municipal pier, the long part that runs out over the ocean. The wide part of the pier was still a leasehold run by the Newcomb family. And I, sometimes, you know, we don't have any whitings here. If you know any, uh, the whiting family, they're descendants of the Newcomb family. They're, they're involved with the museum still, yes. Yeah. They're a great, great family. And um, so the Newcomb family was running, but you know, the, the lease, their lease ended and was to end in 1974. And in their lease, it said that they had to tear their part of the pier down. And so the city was um, ready to capitalize on that idea. In 1974, that pier comes down, we think we'll tear ours down too. Or at least, at least do something to make, but in the meantime, let's do something to make it more viable. And so um, city manager in the late 1960s and the early 1970s was a man named Harry Scott. And the city council had tasked him with making the pier viable. And he came back with the idea of building a man-made island out where the breakwater is today, a big man-made island with a resort hotel and a convention center and a lot of other fine amenities, and extending the pier as a bridge to, to that island. And they put that on the ballot in 1968, and the citizens said, no, we don't want a man-made island. Just give us our pier. You know, it's the last one of, of, it's the last one of its kind. Venice Pier uh, went bankrupt in 1947. That was gone. Uh, Ocean Park Pier went bankrupt in, in the 19, late 1960s, but still kind of standing in the early 1970s. Um, and, uh, and actually quite a hazard, fires and, and falling out. You're nodding your head. You clearly know about the cove. <laughs> um, so this was the last of those, those three great piers that was still standing. No, it didn't have an amusement park on it anymore. No, it didn't have its yacht harbor anymore. No, it was not the most interesting place in, in Los Angeles, but it was it was Santa Monica's Pier that had been around since 1909 and then had been part of people's lives for that long. And it was the last of those three great pleasure piers. So the citizens rejected it when it hit the ballot, but that did not deter Perry Scott. Perry Scott wanted his man-made island with his resort hotel, and he went out and found a developer, someone who would pay for it all. That did not need to go on the ballot and get approval by the citizens. All it needed was approval from the city council. And the city council saw this as a solution. Immediately said, yes, we will, you know, this is a project that we will, uh, we will green light. The developer's project did not include a Santa Monica Pier. 
he did not, the developers did not want the pier to be a bridge to, to his island, to their island, let's keep saying it, to their island. Um, instead, the pier would be demolished in favor of making a, a conventional bridge out of this island. So the pier would be torn down, and that would be the end, the last of the great pleasure piers would be torn down. And this really riled the community, and the movement to save the pier began. Now, when I say the community, the community at this time that was really engaged in the fight was fishermen and fisherwomen and surfers, bumper car operators, bartenders, restaurant workers. There were some artists and activists involved and helped to organize it all, but it was this little group of people this little, that, that had no, never in their lives did they imagine that they could fight the mighty city hall but now they had a cause, and it was not an easy fight. They lost many, many battles as they, as they worked up their way toward the nexus of the fight, and the, what everybody came to realize, just in the nick of time, was that it was an election year. <laughs> Three city council members were up for re-election. So the community went right after those three <laughs> city council members, and, uh, and also enlisted their own, their own candidates. And it was enough to get the city council members to change their mind and save the pier. And that sat well, I think, with the city council members at the time, you know, that they had done the right thing, but it didn't save their, their careers as uh, local politicians. In fact, not a single city council member who voted to tear down the pier was ever re-elected to office. Five lost their election, re-election bids, including the three that year, and one passed away in office. And some people credit the, the Save the Pier movement as being opening the door for the, uh, and inspiring the runner's rights <coughs> movement. I won't go so far as to say that, but a lot of people do I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Judy's more an authority on that than I am. So you heard it from Judy. Um, but you know, thank God for that, that scrappy little community. I always call our organization the scrappy little nonprofit. Because we are, we, we do a lot for just a few people. But uh, this scrappy little community saved something that's near and dear to everyone in this room's heart, as well as Robert Redford's and Arnold Schwarzenegger's. Uh, Robert Redford, by the way, uh, they were shooting the sting in the merry-go-round building during the fight to save the pier. And Robert Redford's quoted in the paper as uh, saying that the pier should be made into a museum. It should not be torn down, it should be made into a museum. And we have the actual petition copy in, in my office of, uh, that has Robert Redford and Paul Newman's signatures, as well as a lot of the crew from the scene. That's a very cherished part in our office. Now, the pier was saved in, uh, in February of 1973, landmarked in 1975 with Proposition 1. Proposition 1 guarantees that the only way that the pier can be altered in a major way or torn down is if it goes to the ballot and the people approve. So our pier is pretty secure, unless you all decide you don't want it anymore. <laughs> um, but that didn't solve the problem. The pier still wasn't viable. Um, the, there was a second movement by the, the same community members to, um, when, to have the city take over the least part of the pier and not, have, not allow that to be torn, torn down either. So the pier was, not only um, was the city having to deal with the pier that they owned, city staff of the city of Santa Monica owned, but now they had to take care of another part of the pier that was falling apart. And nothing was really solved. It wasn't, wasn't going to be viable just because they saved it and landmarked it. The community saved it and landmarked it. So there was still a problem, and there was a task force put together um, to try and figure out what to do with the pier. When you have a pier that has a lot of long-term leaseholds, you know, and can't be changed, um, there's you know, an overwhelming amount of work needing to be done. To, to fortify and ensure the future of the pier. On the winter of 1983, an El Nino year, Mother Nature came in and said, I've got a solution for you. <laughs> on January 27th, um, one of the El Nino storms was rolled in. It was reported to have 10 foot seas. The lower fishing deck at the west end of the pier was only eight feet above mean high tide. So the, the broader Santa Monica community knew that something had to give, and people actually lined up in Palisades Park to um, and break high winds and sleep to watch this storm roll in, and sure enough, it tore out the lower fishing deck at the west end of the pier. 
city manager at that time, a man, I always mispronounce his name, so you can correct me because you always do. John Alshuler. Alshuler. Yeah. I got it right this time. Mm -hmm. um, um, city manager at the time assured the community, don't worry, we will rebuild. And sure enough, the city um, hired a contractor to take a crane out to the west end of the pier to start cleaning up that, the, the damage to the lower fishing deck and get it ready for uh, a rebuild. March 1st, another storm equally big comes rolling in. That crane's still out at the end of the pier in the afternoon. The pier maintenance uh, team warned the contractor, they said, you better get that crane off the pier. And the contractor realizes, yeah, probably ought to start rolling it in. And uh, unfortunately, it's about an hour before quitting time. They, they rolled it in about 50 feet inland, and then it was quitting time. So they left the crane out at the end of the pier. Storm comes in, rocks the pier. By that time, it's all wooden piles and a wooden substructure that was very old and weak. And that crane goes into the ocean and acts as a battering ram and starts tearing out the pier. And that's the damage that you see here. The entire west end is gone, as well as where the La Monica Ballroom was, about half of where the La Monica Ballroom was, is what you see in this picture, the, the big hole on the left, right here. Now, about a third of the pier altogether. John Alshuler um, addresses the press again and says, don't worry, we will rebuild. It's just going to take longer this time. And sure enough, uh, the city uh, began a, a reconstruction project. And this is about when I started the pier. I might even be tending bar right in this building. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what the pier looked like when I started um, in September of 1989. In 1983, right after those storms, that task force um, still had not come up with any solutions, but the city put together the Santa Monica Pier Restoration Corporation. Judy Abdo was on that, the original board for that. And it was to um, oversee the reconstruction of the pier and also to reimagine what the pier can be in the future. And from that Santa Monica Pier Restoration Corporation, that original board, came the concept of making the pier a family friendly venue. And now they had a clean slate to work with. So you and have, free. And free. <laughs> free and accessible, like a park, as you put it to me. So fine dining at the end of the pier, um, instead of a 24-hour little cafe underneath the end of the pier. An amusement park. Um, the businesses should all focus on being family friendly. I came from the boathouse, and well, we like to think that we were family friendly. We were not the most family friendly. You know, we, were, we were a pretty rowdy place getting away from that and going toward family friendly. Mm -hmm. And that's how we got our Pacific Park that we have today. 1996 Pacific Park opened. It was the uh, first, first full-time amusement park on the Santa Monica Pier in 66 years. So when we were celebrating a centennial, two-thirds of that time of the pier's first hundred years, we didn't have an amusement park. We had a roller coaster, we had little traveling carnivals that would come through, we had a, a big slide the slide on burlap sacks. Anybody remember that? that? I don't, but I've heard a lot of it. Um, so occasional amusements, but never a full-time amusement park until 1996. And uh, a few years after openings, uh, Pacific Park uh, converted their power for the Ferris wheel to solar, the first and still only solar-powered Ferris wheel in the world. It immediately made an impact. Um, in the years since, more and more visitors um, the family-friendly concept was working, and uh, today we have, even after COVID, we have estimated the estimates Sorry. range estimates range from 11 to 14 million people. <laughs> That's what kind of an impact this reimagination has had. Thank you, Judy, and, and the people that, that you worked with to make that happen. Um, also, opening up here is a, a venue for events: the Twilight Dance Series, the Twilight Concert Series, Twilight on the Pier. 35-year run as a free concert series. Uh, I mentioned our 360 Beach Festival, our official kickoff to summer with paddleboard racing and swim races and beach volleyball. The first doubles game ever of beach volleyball was played on those courts immediately south of the pier. You know, these, these uh, paddleboard racing I mentioned as roots of the pier. Um, we celebrate the Santa Monica, not just its location and the beach ocean pier, but also its history and its, its deep ties to, to the way people celebrate and, and enjoy the, the beach today. And, uh, and you know, I'm very proud of, of the progress that we've made with that. We allow, we, uh, 
we rent out the property for other people to come and, and have events. We have an upside down car on the pier today to advertise the movie Twister. <laughs> you know, a lot of ways to have fun on the pier. Those just add to the interest and, and draw more people who uh, provide more entertainment for people who are coming and draw people who may or may, may not be coming. Cirque du Soleil was instrumental in that in the 1980s. Um, a lot of people thought the pier was closed in the 1980s after the storms. The concerts assured people that no, the pier is still open and you can come and enjoy it. And so did Cirque du Soleil, but to an entirely different crowd. A crowd that probably would not have come to the pier, to even, didn't even care if the pier was still open, was coming to Cirque du Soleil and many of those ended up trickling up onto the pier and enjoying a pier that, that really hadn't a lot to enjoy previous to that. So very, very big events um, and the impact that events can have on a venue. We have more events now today than ever. Some people think that we have too many. I don't think we have about the right amount. We can always do more because there's, there's always people we can reach out to who may or may not have ever come to the pier, but one of these events might bring them and they can enjoy. I'm going to go into some slides that are very specific to this crowd because I think that, uh, that they'll draw some memories. The first one, if I'm going to wonder why would I include a kind of blurry photo of a couple guys painting a, a booth. That is the booth to the bumper cars. If you remember the bumper, the old bumper cars out towards the, kind of in the middle of the pier. Uh, Maynard Ostro ran those bumper cars. You know, he was one of the people instrumental in <laughs> saving the pier. The two gentlemen. That, the man who's kneeling down there is uh, Pat Lennon. Anybody ever hear Pat Lennon? <laughs> Do you know the, the band Venice that's been playing around this park forever? The those Lennon are all, Sisters? Those are all Lennons, yep. All the Lennon 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 Sisters. Related to the Lennon Sisters. So Pat was, uh, he was, both these guys were involved in the movement to save the pier. Pat was a cook at, at Alice Kitchen on the pier. And Maynard Ostro enlisted him to paint this, uh, this ticket booth and repaint the ticket booth. Repaint the ticket. It was never quite done right. It had more more layers of paint on it than it probably had wood. The gentleman who's hunched over is Claude Bessie. Anyone? Slash Magazine. Slash Magazine, the founder of Slash Magazine. Also worked at Alice Kitchen for a while. Um, he was also a punk rock musician, so a punk rock musician who founded Slash Magazine. Next slide is going to get some side. Oh, yes. Moby Stock and Sinbad's. I, since, the, um, since the release of the first book, I've had things donated and I found things. I found this on eBay, actually. Um, this is actually a, two sides of the same napkin. So Sinbad's and Moby's dog were owned by the same family, uh, Westbrook, the, part of the Newcomb family. And uh, I'm, very, I'm very glad I included that in this book. Sharing people with some of the, sorry, sharing with people the ephemera that I've collected over the years. Like this sticker for the skaters ballroom and the Monica ballroom. A ticket to a Spade Cooley show, Boathouse Menu, of course I'm going to have that. <laughs> My days. Twilight Dancers, posters, and of course in the book we, uh, I, I do bring us all the way up through COVID. And we got our own uh, uh, six feet social distancing stickers on the ground. We get uh, a little more into, for, with this edition of the book, a little more into movies shot on the pier and television shows shot on the pier. You know, we have, a, we have The Sting, we have Inside Daisy Clover with Natalie Wood running with her dog. We have um, Night Tide, Dennis Hopper. And um, we actually had in 2010, we had um, the memorial service for Dennis Hopper. And, and that's a fun story. Um, I knew that Dennis Hopper had passed away, and my caller ID on my phone, I was booking events in the merry-go-round at the time, and the caller ID on my phone a few days later said, Easy Writer Productions. And I know what this calls for. And there's a, a gentleman and a woman came to visit me for a tour. They were going to have an event. They didn't even say what it was about, but I had a pretty good idea. And, um, and then I start talking about Dennis Hopper, which, you know, like trying, to, trying to drag it out of him. And I start talking about Night Tide being filmed in the pier. Dennis Hopper, up until this movie was made, had had bit roles in James Dean movies, all three James Dean movies. You know, he was a struggling actor trying to, trying to build his career. 1960 was his first ever starring role in Night Tide. And the woman, I, I caught the woman's attention with that one, and she looked kind of familiar. 
And she said, what, what year did you say that was again? I said, 1960. She said, well, that's the year I was born. Mm. Dennis was my father. Mm. Right then I knew I had a book. <laughs> <laughs> and they had a very nice memorial service for him. The cartoon. Um, my daughter used to watch this cartoon regularly. My oldest daughter. It's Rocket Power. Are any of you familiar with it? It's about these skateboarding kids, skateboarding and surfing kids. And they're always hanging out at the pier. And if any of you remember the Surfview Cafe, it's patterned exactly um, the, the, the place that these kids would hang out in this cartoon was the Surfview Cafe. And just really cool to be able to acknowledge that. You know, it's not just uh, movies and, and TV shows, but cartoons have been inspired by it. South Park used the sign twice, and then it's run, and I think it's even still running. But they've used the pier sign twice. And uh, with that, you know, in the book, so there's so much more than the history of the pier in this book. Um, I've included sections about uh, the, the pier as inspiration for arts. You see that mural at Fourth and Ocean Park with the horses um, escaping from the merry-go-round. You see Jules Muck's mural up on Ocean, uh, Ocean, also on Ocean Park Boulevard now. You see uh, the one on Olympic, right by the high school. You know, the pier has inspired a lot of muralists. Um, the pier has inspired movies and television, and peers inspired sculptors, photographers. We, there's some photography in that book um, that, that is truly art, some contemporary photographers who have donated to the book. And uh, so, so I address that. I address, you know, the first, have you ever heard of Walter Hoffs, arts curator Walter Hoffs? His first ever show, he's a fairly influential arts curator. Um, his first ever curated show was inside the merry-go-round building. Where they, um, where he and his team covered all the horses with canvas, and then hung paintings, uh, modern art paintings, all around the carousel, and played um, very, very distinct jazz throughout it all, and they called it action. Um, we had a, an arts group come in during the first Freeze Festival a year and a half ago, and they tried to recreate that to some degree with the. Uh, with actual live performers and and uh, and jazz throughout it. Um, you know the the pier has. Uh, what I want to say I covered art, I covered movies. You know I'm also in this book. Oh, I know what I want to show. One of my favorite pieces of art. And everybody should think about it. Thank you, Jerry. I came across Tom Britton. He's still with us. This guy who made these beautiful beautiful paintings back in the 1970s and, uh, and allowed me to use them, use his paintings as the end pages. Mm -hmm. nice. And then of course you get what you all came for and were hoping to see, Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> and Robert Redford. You know, the, the book has been a joy to work on, um, just as the peer has been a joy to work on. And I know that uh, some of you may have questions. I know some of you may have some stories that you want to share. And I would like to open up the floor to that right now. I have a question, Jim. Yes. Um, the pier is an icon that's known everywhere. If you go to London, you know it's at London Pier. Um, we want it for generations to come. What, what kind of maintenance is done? Um, so that we know that this will be preserved. The, the city of San Marcos still owns the entire pier and, and maintains it. There is a pier maintenance uh, team, uh, the department of the city, that is always uh, replacing deck doors or handling deck doors back then, always painting the railings. It's a job that they can never keep up with. It's a lot of work, but there is a team that's specifically dedicated to that. When it comes to uh, the, the piles that are set up every few years, and uh, we have to replace piles every few years. You know, now, I mentioned you know, we had originally had concrete piles of the concrete deck. Then we had the wooden piles of the concrete deck. And eventually, that concrete deck all disappeared and was replaced with wood. And that's what most of us have known throughout our lives. Um, the, when the pier was reconstructed after the storms, the breakwater was not. So the breakwater is not protecting the pier very well. But the, the substructure of the here, the sections of the pier that's out over the ocean is all concrete, much better technology. They use the right sand this time. And it's also, also specifically designed that that lower fishing deck is also concrete. 
So in the unlikely event that that fishing deck falls into the ocean, it's not going to bang against um, concrete piles and damage. It's just going to fall to the floor and stay. Um, very well thought out so that they didn't have to rebuild the breakwater. There is talk of rebuilding the breakwater. The Santa Monica Bay Restoration Foundation's talking about it, not to bring back boats, but to create a marine habitat and also to protect the pier. But the reason the, the pier is constantly undergoing maintenance, and city staff will be the first to tell you that the pier is operating in the red. When you see 11 to 14 million visitors, you're like, well, how can that possibly be? But it is a, a very, very expensive and con continuous maintenance operation. Jerry? I remember for years and years you said at the July 4th fire works from the pier. Oh, yeah. In fact, when I first came out to Philadelphia to this area, it was on July 4th, 1967. And that's how I was got off the plane down to the beach and saw the fireworks. I know they have a great event at Corsair Field now, so that's cool. So it's, it's, just, it's part of the history. I remember there was such a yeah. massive amount of people that were coming. It got kind of hard to, uh, to keep under control. Yeah. And the same with the Twilight Concert Band Series, which were brilliant. You just always look for the lineup each year excitedly to see which bands are going to be coming. Will that ever happen again? Uh, well, I can't say if it will ever happen again, but the pier has always been accessible, very accessible, and, and that's been a, a big part of its success um, throughout the years. It's the reason that Charles Lou um, chose to become involved with the pier and lease that land south of the pier was because at that time the red line had a, a car that um, ended right next to where the pier is today. And also there was the shuttle going up and down the beach, the shuttle that it, the, anybody ride that shuttle? Did you pay for it? No. Nope. No, you're on the back, didn't you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Everybody hopped on the back. I don't know if there's a single paying customer, and I don't know what the drivers were thinking. <laughs> Everybody hopped on the back. Um, and today, you know, the, the pier is even more accessible. We have the, we're at the end of the 10 freeway. Um, we have a train that, that brings people here. Um, it's, it's so easy, and even even with the changes to from from double lanes to single lanes and on most of our streets, it's so easy to get to and then find the pier. And and that's certainly what, what made the fireworks shows so popular was that anybody could get here and enjoy them. And what made the concerts so successful was was ease of access. You couldn't have couldn't have the same thing happen at say Hermosa Pier, because there's nowhere to park, right? Um, we have Big parking lots in Santa Monica. It's a, it was, you know, Santa Monica really thought well for itself um, throughout, I think, its entire existence. But along with that, you know, creating all that access and ability to get here, came the problems of having too much. You know, Monica Barn, for example, 50,000 50, people came to open in the Monica Barn. Can I do one short follow up to the first trip? The city is so lucky. Have you, uh, with your commitment and dedication to the pier and find out all this stuff, had you involved? And uh, I think that's great. Thank you. You know, over the years, they walk down to the pier, walk up. I'm 80 now, get a little more fire. But I wondered. Would it ever be possible to have some little shuttle every 10 or 15 minutes, maybe a solar powered shuttle, that would take people that people who know, older people who are tired or with disabilities that could go up and easy enough come down? Maybe some business could sponsor it and get some publicity. And I just thought that would be a good idea because it's hard. Idea. It is a good idea. And it's, uh, it's come up before, but it's never really, yeah. never really gotten legs. You know, you know you're, you're an activist. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, but that's my exercise, though. So. Yes, sir. 
What do you mean by box? I mean, there's a pier down at Venice, there's a pier down at Nice Beach, there's a pier in Santa Cruz. I mean, why, why do you use the word box? It's the last of the, the great pleasure piers that were here in the San Monica Bay, that, uh, you know, the ones with the big amusement parks. So the last of the San Monica piers. Yes, Roger. Yeah, one of the things that you, you, you didn't talk about, it, I haven't bought this version of the book, but I, I don't know if you talked about it in the book, but, but you know, the, the, there was a period for 35 years before 1909, and it really is fundamental to the history of the city because that was the train, and you know, the whole port, the whole area was really founded on the. Well, there were two. Uh, there was the, the, the Shoe Fly yeah, right. here, Shoe Fly Landing, uh, which was fundamental to the early. Of the city, it was very close to where the San Juan Pier is today, and then there was the uh, California Independence. Yeah, well, there was the, the railroad here. Yeah. Um, that was 1875. Right. But they're, you know, they're essentially the same place. And, and they are. It's a continuum of a long history of the, of the city. And no, I have an anecdote. This may take a couple of seconds, but I have to talk about this. This is when the pier collapsed in 1983. Uh, a bunch of us activists in Ocean Park had. Lobby about uh, the period of the uh, Ocean Fund development in Ocean Park. And uh, there was a Coastal Commission hearing on that development. So a bunch of us were down in that Long Beach at the Coastal Commission meeting. And all of a sudden, all these commissioners kept leaving the dives. And we were kind of wondering what's going on. Well, it turned out at that moment the pier was collapsing. And they were all going off into their offices to monitor what was going on. So we didn't get to speak because they wouldn't let us speak in, in the public hearing. So a bunch of us got really upset, so we demanded to meet with the mayor. Well, I think it was Ruth I don't remember. So we're talking to her in her office, and she says, I gotta go, I can't talk to you, the pier is collapsing. <laughs> so she runs out to the pier. And so it was like, and then I, I took a walk the following morning, and the entire pier had flown into Ocean Park. Right. Yeah, crank, I don't know, it was in crank. All of that stuff that got in the middle of 1983, I'll never forget that. And you know where a lot of those deck boards are in a lot of that wood? Pablo, where are you? Yeah, the Topanga Theatrica on the stage. Yeah, the Topanga Theatrica on the stage. Oh, really? Yeah, that's the stage is made out of those deck boards. Where, where is it? Topanga Canyon. Oh. Will uh, Pierce, the yeah, upper Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, so the concert series? What is the likelihood that, that comes back in some capacity? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, how long do you got? Um, <laughs> I get the issue. I get that. But. There, there are several issues. That even, even since, uh, even since the reimagination, you know, the concert series were getting was getting very, very popular, and I would say he was never comfortable with so many gathering on the beach. And, um, I don't know how many times we had to hear the lecture that. If one person in that crowd on the beach was having an incident like a heart attack, they're gone. But the, the fire department would not get, be able to get to them and save their life. Mm -hmm. So you know, we had to live with that guilt. But, you know, unfortunately, that never happened. Um, and we were on probation up until the, the last year. The city was always like, this, this is your last year. We had the Jimmy Cliff concert in, at the end of 2016, and knife was brandished backstage. So we were really under tight scrutiny for the 2017 season um, and ag agreed to not book as big of acts and, and to take that step to make, you know, trying to attract fewer people, which is counterintuitive for any, any <laughs> right? And um, so we booked a kid to open up uh, the season that nobody had ever heard of. Uh, his name was Khalid. And we were, everybody was comfortable with it. Police, fire department, city manager's office was happy. Yes, nobody's ever heard of this guy. You guys have fun. We'll see how it works. About a month before our opening night, when the lead was to play, the Kardashians were tweeting his name out all over the place. Oh. And he became the most popular musician at the time in the world. And we sat with public safety right after that happened. Sorry. And even our, our staff offered to, to book someone else. And they said, no. You've gotten, gotten this far, just, just give us a chance to properly prepare for it. What nobody really understood about Khalid's popularity was that his, his main audience was teenage girls. Mm -hmm. And so 
walk, every every concert, we would put up a stage and, and build the venue out of that, convert it from a parking lot to a, a, a concert venue, beginning at about eight o'clock in the morning. By nine o'clock, and most people didn't, you know, we wouldn't even see people come in to, to try to set up where they were going to be until like one o'clock in the afternoon, the earliest. At nine o'clock in the morning, we had a line of teenage girls mm. from the grand entrance of the bureau by the merry-go-round building that was starting to grow. Eventually, it got it went past Casa del Mar. So a full half mile. So teenage girls, you know, not not threatening until you know you, you get them into the venue and they're all jumping up and down and they literally broke the pier in a few places. <laughs> um, the numbers that tweeted that uh, Ali tweeted out sixty thousand people it was actually about twenty five thousand people, but it was a heck of a way when you're already on probation and you've been told to. to bring it down to the heck of a way to have your first concert right after that. And so we were informed early on that year, this is it. You know, the, the series either ends or is completely reimagined. So we're crossing our fingers through the rest of the series, hoping it doesn't, you know, nothing bad happens and we can have a good conversation. We wrap up the season and about a month later, the Las Vegas incident happened. Mm -hmm. And with, the, with all those deaths at a, at a festival, a music festival, shooter in a high rise hotel, mm -hmm. um, police were very quick to point out that we had a pretty tall hotel right next to the beach, and that could have just as easily been us. And they discovered that the shooter was, um, was Googling not only Las Vegas, but also the Santa Monica Pier. Mm -hmm. So we dodged a bullet on that one, but we knew we had no, no argument to try to keep the series going in, in the format that we, we, we all fell in love with. So we agreed to move the series to Wednesday nights in the fall and book acts that nobody had ever heard of. <laughs> and, uh, and we reimagined the series. And in that reimagination re period, we, um, we came to finally utilize the entire pier. We put a stage out at the end of the pier. We put a stage in Pacific Park. We put art. We put sculptures along the main walkway, and, and created a really good experience, um, and an, exper an experience that has inspired our local locals' nights since. If you go to our locals' nights, we activate the the entire pier for most of them. Um, in the winter months, we keep it really toward the east end, the warmer end. But um, you know, we created this great experience, but nobody wanted to pay for. Sponsors began pulling out. When we got to March of 2020, um, we were preparing for a, a, a twilight season, even though we'd heard buzz about a pandemic. But mar by March 2020, we had zero sponsors. We had nobody to pay for this. The city at that time um, was giving us a grant. I'm happy to disclose. You know, we we always for many years we've had a $500,000 operating grant. And for the last few years of Twilight, a 250,000 grant specific to Twilight. And the city threw in security, um, the police with their um, secure. So um, all we had to apply towards what's traditionally been a million dollar plus series was $250,000. Well, we've gone to quarantine, the world changes, the city is all of a sudden broke. <laughs> and that's first off the $250,000 for the Twilight. And then cuts our grant in half. And our grant today is only $150,000. Just the, the impact that the, the pandemic had on us. But that's no money and no, not even tapping into our operating budget that we can start to pay for the series with. And with nobody wanting to sponsor it, sponsorships are still, you know, sponsorships now are as difficult as they were for a, a concert series that nobody wanted, let alone if we were to try to do. Just, just anything. Right now, the sponsorship market is really dried up. I'm sure you're going through the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, you know, the the concept of uh, putting up a Twilight, a free concert series now. That's a pipe dream for my office. Mm -hmm. But what we have done is created these locals nights, and I, I hope that you've been uh, the the brain brainchild behind locals nights is sitting right behind you, Nick <laughs> Ralston. Um, came onto our board, and we've had many board members come to our organization and say, we need to do something for the locals. Nick came in with ideas, and his best idea so far has been this, this locals night, which is offering, you know, offering the peer 
to the, the local community saying, we're dedicating a night just to you. But it's not only locals. It's not only anyway. locals. No. No. So it's the third Thursday of every month from September through May. We're not foolish enough to think that we can get away with a locals night during the summer months when people go out of town and the piers all run by tourists. You know, it's just it would be a, a false flag. But um the uh, the concept of locals night is that it's by Santa Monica and for Santa Monica. So all of our bands, all of our the, the women who does the people who do stories inside the, the merry-go-round, all of our activities and entertainment are Santa Monicans. If it's a band, whether they're teenagers or, or adults, uh, at least one member has to live in Santa Monica. So we keep true to that thing. We have car shows with Santa Monicans, um, and then for Santa Monicans, we really only mark um, do our marketing focused at, uh, as local as we can. But anybody's welcome. I mean, it's not you know, you're not not check with your ID as you walk onto the pier and oh, you're not welcome, okay, you gotta go. But you know, as a tourist myself, when I go to other, when I visit other places, I wanna do what the locals do. And so, you know, we're opening that up and letting people experience Santa Monica by, that's put on by Santa Monicans. And it has that same feeling. I don't know if you were here in the 1980s and, and the 1990s and what the Twilight concert series was then, but that's what locals nights right now feel a lot like. You know, where if you're from Ocean Park and you have a friend that lives in Montana, you say, let's meet at the pier tonight and then enjoy some entertainment. Right. So it's a, a brilliant concept and we're really enjoying putting that on. Yeah. Uh, let's just say if they know Buddy Ben from LA would to audition, how would they go about that process? Uh, yeah, it's not watching. No. <laughs> we're all this summer, so there's a thing. <laughs> the way. Uh, we do have other events, you know, like our Pier 360 the, uh, Beach Festival, where we hire bands that are not from Santa Monica. Do you and it's all online uh, to find information at Santa Monica Pier. Yeah. Or? Sound like a pier dog. Yeah. We, get you. we want to make some time for Jim to be able to sign books and for you to be able to purchase books. Have I got all? Um, <laughs> it's been wonderful. The conversation has been great. The questions have been wonderful. Um, but we want to be sure to. Yeah. Okay. Jim, yeah. I tried to add something. Sure. I, I think it would be really interesting. Um, I was very young in 1973, but all I know is that in the household, I never heard my parents argue. <laughs> and uh, I didn't understand what was going on. Um, my mom, of course, loves history and loves Santa Monica. And the Pierre is Santa Monica. So, of course, she would want to save the Pierre. Yeah. But my father was one of those councilmen. Ooh. And who so, voted to tear it down. <laughs> yeah. And so, as I said, I've never heard my parents argue as much as they did at that time. Yeah. He is a good man, and he thought he was doing the right thing, uh, but it was the wrong decision. And, uh, uh, and he did lose the seat, um, as, as you said, uh, for the voting against it. So uh, I thought I wanted to share that. Yeah, you know, the first time I, I spoke at the yeah. first time I spoke at a Santa Monica History Museum about it was at the, the Women's Club. Yeah. The big audience. And, and I knew your mother was going to be there. She's the one who invited me. You know, I did not know how to best tell that story. You know, the, you know, I, I wasn't going to go the Gur route. You know, get the Gur out, which was Gabriel Rankin Reedy. Yeah. Was, well, I appreciate you not. You didn't really <laughs> mention, but I just thought, you know, it, it happened, and uh, um, and I think it's a funny story. When my parents never argued, but over this pure they did. <laughs> yeah. Just after that, your mother wrote me the most beautiful handwritten thank you note. Thank you notes are, you don't receive those yeah. very often, and it was a really lovely gesture. Uh, Real quick, I just happen to remember something that shocked so many people in Santa Monica, and I don't know if you remember this, but in the very first time the Santa Monica Daily Press Surprisingly, we did their April Fool's Day <laughs> issue. Oh, that's big on the front page is a picture of the first real and 
falling over and smashed. And everybody was thinking it was real. <laughs> so, those were fun issues. Yeah. Well, Jim, thank you so much for being here tonight.